Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. As a national training and technical assistance provider, Equitas develops resources, conducts trainings, and offers 24-7 consultations for prosecutors and allied professionals. For more information on Equitas, please visit our website at equitasresource.org. You can also follow Equitas on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. The link to each is available on our website. Today's webinar is supported by the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance. The information presented in this webinar does not necessarily reflect the views of the BJA. Presenting our webinar today is Equitas Attorney Advisor John Curland. Before joining Equitas, John Curland worked for 16 years as a prosecutor in the District Attorney's Office in Berks County, Pennsylvania, serving as Chief Deputy District Attorney chief of trials and assistant district attorney. Through his career, John has successfully prosecuted a variety of offenses, including domestic violence homicides, campus sexual assaults, cold case sexual assaults, intimate partner violence, stalking, child pornography and exploitation, child ab abuse and molestation, and human trafficking. I will now turn it over to John. Thank you, Mary, and uh, I wanna thank uh, Tara and uh, St. Paul Prosecutor's Office uh, once again for inviting us to present this material. This is part three of our IPS webinar series uh, where we're talking about identifying, preserving, and presenting digital evidence while hopefully pro uh, protecting and understanding privacy rights. Uh, so we're really going to be breaking up this presentation today, the 60-minute presentation, into three parts. And the first part, or first roughly third, is going to be covering and talking about the types of ways in which technology can manifest in our case, um, how to identify it, how to look for it, and some uh, investigative and legal tools in which it can be seized and then utilized. The second part we're going to be talking about is discussing a little bit about theories about admissibility and how we can get this evidence in in our cases in our court when we're presenting uh, by analyzing relevant uh, evidence rules and case law. And the last sort of portion of it is we want to talk about the privacy aspects uh, that can be implicated with digital ev evidence and ways that we can hopefully minimize the intrusions of these areas onto these victims. Now, these are all three really big topics. Each of them individually could proper, properly be presented in an hour presentation. Frankly, each of them could be presented independently in their own seminar. Um, so we're going to be trying to at least get an apprehension of some of the issues in the time that we have. Uh, the second part where we're talking about uh, theories of admissibility and utilizing evidence rules, we're going to try to have a bit interactive with case examples and discussion about how we might uh, get some uh, pieces of evidence in or uh, exhibits of digital evidence in, in, uh, in some scenarios. So let me begin, where do you find digital evidence and what is digital evidence? And this is really a broad category that we, we have, when, we have when we're designating something as digital evidence, because uh, it can really encompass or uncover almost everything, just like digital evidence and digital communications uh, touches each of our individual lives and impacts us, so it does with the people in our cases, the victims, the witnesses, um, and the offenders as well. And so the scope of digital evidence is really wide. So identifying its relevance to cases can, is, is no easy task or quick pithy encapsulation. Here's a little chart about ways to identify it. This is by no means exhaustive of the only ways in which we can categorize or identify digital evidence. Um, this isn't to say that some forms of digital evidence can also be overlapping into different areas. Um, and there might be types of digital evidence which we haven't even contemplated now, not only because there's so much different kinds of digital evidence, but this is also an area that's constantly changing and constantly evolving. Uh, this is one of the areas in our society where progress is really at, at exponential warp speed. 
Um, so it's really sometimes uh, hard or difficult to give something that's entirely up to date. Uh, but when we're talking about digital evidence and, and how we're going to be sort of talking about it for today's presentation is we can be talking about evidence that can come from a computer. Um, some examples, but by no means not every kind of uh, digital evidence that can come from a computer, of course, is going to be things like emails or browser or internet history or uh, synced information. And what we mean by synced information is when your computer is syncing with different networks or Wi-Fi providers or routers. Um, now, evidence here, we could be wanting this kind of digital evidence for lots of different purposes. We might want to be looking at, for, uh, looking at some of it for, for content um, to show what a person was saying or communicating with other people. We might be wanting to use it to show state of mind or opportunity or, or just someone's knowledge when we're looking for what sorts of things are in their computer, things they were searching for or researching or trying to find out. We might also want to be finding out uh, when someone was utilizing a computer or how it was utilized or how they had uh, access to a location or to show their presence. Now, a lot of this type of evidence on the computer can also overlap in our cell phones, too. And our cell phones are really, more often than not, really just computers, uh, computers in of themselves and computers that are more powerful than anything that was maybe available in the market in the 1970s or 80s and, and usually 1990s. Um, but some examples, and by no means exhaustive, we're going to dig a little deeper and a little bit about other kinds of records we might, or types of digital evidence, we wanna get directly from cell phones can be things like text messages, photographs, but also third-party applications or apps. Um, the purposes about what we might be using these things is, is unlimited, really. Uh, it might be directly to show communications or same thing we're trying to find on with computers. The, the things, the commonalities or the two big commonalities, at least in this context, that cell phones and computers have is that they are physical, tangible devices uh, that we want to examine. They have content we can search and that we might want to seize either by viewing it on a screen or by actually taking the devices and having people properly qualified examine them digitally for the contents and reproduce them, even if sometimes they've been deleted. Um, social media, though, is a little bit of a different animal because when we're looking for digital evidence that's contained in social media or any kind of cloud, it's not necessarily a, a physical device relative to a subject that we're looking for, uh, but it's in, in the cloud, in the internet. It's everywhere and nowhere at the same, the same time. And of course, the types of things that we might be searching for with social media can of course be posts that someone posts online or in response to articles, um, photos, videos, uh, other things, blogs, it could be anything, uh, podcasts as, as well. Um, and why would we be looking for social media? Maybe because there is something threatening in social media uh, that we want to be able to trace back and find the person who posted it. Um, maybe, again, it's more evidence about someone's intentions or communications or state of mind. Maybe we're trying to find evidence on social media because a computer or cell phone device has been effectively wiped or cleaned or deleted, and we want to find some other resource or, or, or repository of the digital evidence we were looking for. Um, and then there's also a big catch-all with digital evidence of other devices. I'm sure most folks might have been familiar with the Internet of Things, or that phrase, which eh, was probably more in vogue, I think, five or six years ago, but really is still applicable for the concept. But the idea is that we have so many devices, especially with as chip miner miniaturization becomes increasingly sophisticated, we have multiple devices which can connect to the Internet. And this is something really that can impact our own lives about devices and things we have that access the internet or access the web or, or some sort of computer network in ways that might even be reflexive for us and things we're not thinking about, but things we want to be thinking about in our case. Um, maybe to show what a person was doing or not doing. 
Um, an example I can think of, I, I remember I had some infant mortality cases or infant fatality cases uh, where a unique piece of evidence I wanted to find was someone's uh, interaction or what they were doing on Xbox Live because I wanted to prove they were more interested in playing a video game than they were um, tending to the kid or to contradict something they said about their care of the child that was involved in the fatality. Um, but these are the sorts of things when we're thinking about searching and looking for evidence, we really have to think expansively and, and creatively. Um, there could be devices, of course, uh, like the Alexas, the Google Nests, uh, HomePods, things like that, uh, that may be connected or who knows, maybe even have recording. GPS-enabled devices that can corroborate or establish what someone's physical location during an event would be. Uh, maybe exercise or fitness or health monitors that can show what someone's uh, physical state was um, and help us establish a timeline or understand a timeline of an event we're trying to litigate or understand or present evidence of. So again, by no means exhaustive, but if nothing else, hopefully what we've talked about is different ways uh, that we want to be thinking of, of where digital evidence may, may reside, the repositories of digital evidence. Uh, but in, in an adversarial legal form, we of course want to think about what kind of tools can we use to seize digital evidence. And that's a variety. And I, I should probably begin with the caveat that's at the, uh, the footer here. Um, the ability and legal authority to obtain types of digital evidence, it's something that's constantly changing and constantly evolving. So we always want to be up to date on the law and constantly check the law. Um, for example, generally speaking, someone's physical location uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and no one would have really argued with a straight face that that was subject to Fourth Amendment protection. Um, these days, with the level of detail and specificity that we can obtain someone's physical location through GPS records, phone records, cell phone locations, Wi-Fi hits, pings, and things like that, um, those are that's something that's being more recognized might have some level of Fourth Amendment protection, uh, especially what's being sort of hashed out right now in evolving Supreme Court case law like Jones versus U.S. and and uh, in the Carpenter case as well. Um, but the tools we wanna to be using to, uh, to seize digital evidence, one device of course is gonna be something like subpoenas. And the thing is with subpoenas, you can get a lot of information often with subpoenas such as uh, essential business records, subscriber information, maybe transaction history, how often maybe uh, someone, someone's device was calling numbers or being called and what numbers. Um, uh, IP addresses uh, that a device may have accessed. And of course, when we know an IP address, uh, what that information is gonna tell us is, it can tell us the location where that IP address was located if we wanna get, uh, get someone's access down. So if we know uh, an IP address, then we can probably find a physical location. Uh, we might also be able through an I, with an IP address, we can find out uh, what internet service provider uh, owns that IP address and who the subscriber is. So we might even be able to find a, a person or an account that was utilizing the IP address and connect it. Limitation usually for subpoenas though, is that it's going to be a, a little bit difficult because a subpoena isn't gonna have any sort of probable cause affidavit or determination by, uh, attached to it. So we're not really with subpoenas often going to be able to get the content of communications, like what someone is saying in their phone calls, in their text messages or their emails, but we are going to be able to get the fact that a phone call or text message was made, just not what was in it. Um, because that's that sort of stuff's going to be content related and generally more protected. So the sort of devices we want to probably do for that is going to be court orders or search warrant or search warrants. And really the utility, and sometimes in some jurisdictions and under some wiretap laws, court orders and search warrants might be largely in, in, interchangeable in some degree. Uh, but the advantage of course is with search warrants and court orders is that there's going to have to be a representation made to a court about the legal basis about why we can obtain them 
and then a sign off by some sort of neutral uh, judicial authority or by the judge. So therefore, there's a lot better way as long as we have sufficient investigation to justify uh, the granting of the court order or the granting of the search warrant. There's going to be a better basis to argue the legal validity uh, uh, in, in the legality of the seizure of things like locate, location data, um, where someone's device was or where a device was accessing, as well as in appropriate circumstances is when we obtain content. Um, but of course, the other tool that can be used to seize uh, digital evidence is going to be something like just the consent uh, from the person who has authority or someone who has apparent authority to, to access or obtain a device. Um, now, consent works the same way it always does in search and seizure issues. It has to be voluntarily given. Um, and the voluntariness of consent is obviously going to be dependent to a large degree on the level of police interaction, whether we're in that mere encounter, investigative detention, or arrest. It's also going to uh, depend on how informed a person is. Um, and that's going to, a lot of times, like so many areas of consent, uh, the more you tell someone about their, their authority not to comply, maybe then the less likely it is they will consent. And so that's a balance that has to be, be struck out. Now, phone records, I do want to discuss this, and what because sometimes there can be misunderstandings and confusions about what's included in phone records. Generally, when we get someone's phone records from a communication carrier, this isn't going to have something that has the content of texts or calls. To get that, usually either we're going to need something in real time obtaining that, uh, such as an interception order, or we're going to need the actual device itself. Sometimes a communications provider, and by communications provider, I'm of course talking about telephone wireless companies, but I could also be talking about social media companies like Facebook or Twitter or, or other uh, um, uh, information technology companies like that. Sometimes these companies aren't keeping records of the contents of someone's messages or calls. Sometimes they are, like that's more often true with Twitter or Facebook or something like that. Uh, but when we get phone records, um, depending on how we obtain them, they're not often including content. But what they will often usually include at a minimum is going to be the name of a person that's assigned the number or at least the person that registered for that account. Um, when necessary, but also a record of calls uh, and text messages that were made. The form can usually take the form, it can be coming into evidence as a business record, because this is going to be something that the, that company keeps in the regular course of business. They need to, so they can create proper billing and, main, and, and make sure their own capacity is, is properly planned for. Uh, and it could be a printout, either in terms of a digital printout or digital copy of it, or sometimes even if they're old school, a hard copy as well. So, but other considerations or other tools about that we wanna be thinking of for when we're preserving digital evidence or looking to seize digital evidence is we wanna be thinking also about preservation letters and the purpose of preservation letters, and this is a, a vehicle that's recognized under Title III law, so any sort of inter communications company that uh, it can satisfy uh, interstate commerce is going to have to satisfy this. But if we know or believe that the contents of some device or some account or some subscriber is going to be relevant to our investigation, we want to make sure that a company doesn't write that over or delete it. And so a preservation letter sent to them uh, can be in order for them to, to properly preserve it. And if you, if you ever want to see a copy of our preservation letter, contact us, we can give you a sample. The other thing we want to use consistent with the law in our own jurisdiction is a non-disclosure order. When we're obtaining information, not from a device, but from a company, from a communications provider, uh, we want to make sure and be, be certain of the contours of our law that uh, that to which the court can order the company not to disclose it uh, to the customer whose account is the target of our search and our seizure. Reason why, of course, we don't want the investigation to be implicated by the company warning that person or the target being warned. Generally speaking, a disclosure or not, a company being ordered not to disclose 
that's only for a finite or set period of time. Um, I think usually 90 days or six months is the maximum. Uh, extensions can be applied for, but absent a specific order of non-disclosure to, to a company, um, then most companies are going to be obligated to notify their customers that, hey, we gave a copy of your records away. Uh, and that's uh, part of the user uh, company, uh, the user agreement with that customer. Other tools to obtain digital evidence and the, to be alert for is maybe if law enforcement wants to assume the online presence, maybe of a victim, uh, to see uh, how that victim is being targeted by an offender. Um, we might want to have some explicit consent or authority from that victim or the guardian or person with apparent authority giving that consent to do so. The other thing we want to be aware of is another consideration or another tool is that when we are working with these companies uh, that might be international as well as nationally based and be bureaucracies that might dwarf our local government or things that are difficult for, our, for us to understand. One of the things we can utilize when we're figuring out, gee, who do we contact at this company? What's their protocol? What's their procedure? How can we make our law enforcement or investigative requests go more smoothly um, is just doing a Google search or something of subpoena compliance, Facebook, subpoena compliance, Google, which will probably bring you to a PDF or various sort of protocol guides that we can use as well as people we should contact. Another consideration we might want to use too, especially when we're searching electronic devices such as computers or cell phones, is that we have a secondary search team or a taint team is what they're sometimes referred to. The purpose of this is, of course, because a lot of evidence is going to be contained on an electronic device, some of which might be beyond the scope of our investigation or the scope of our request. But of course, when you're searching digital devices, it's very hard for forensic searchers to just zero out or zero in. It's not organized that way that they can just look in the appropriate compartment or computer. They have to search everything uh, to, to target the narrow thing that we might be looking for to show that we're not going beyond or that the team responsible for the investigative investigation isn't going beyond the scope of, of the authority of a search granted by a search warrant or court order. Um, they could have a taint team conduct the search, which might see everything, but then only provides the primary uh, team with the evidence relative to the, the scope of, this, of the search that's permitted. And this isn't just something that's always commonly used, um, but, uh, but it can be a tool that's used, especially uh, when, when we're trying to be very surgical and what, what's being searched for in a device. So other tools to search uh, digital evidence, of course, is going to be the uh, forensic exam examination. And something that shouldn't be minimized either is a manual examination of device. And of course, the basics for any kind of preserving uh, for any sort of forensic or manual examination is going to have to be preserving the evidence. In other words, making sure that it can't be remotely um, um, uh, accessed or deleted or altered from outside, because of course, most devices, you don't have to be holding them to impact the content. Uh, the methods which we want to do that, you want to be consulting with your forensic search teams. In the old day, it would be putting the bag in a Faraday bag or a metallic bag so it couldn't have any content. Sometimes it's just turning the device off but you should be working and having a collaboration with your forensic search teams about what they need for devices to be protected. Of course, any forensic search is gonna to have to be authorized through memorialized and uh, warrant or consent. Um, another thing too is so many devices are protected by passcodes, especially phones these days. And we're gonna talk about a little bit in, uh, in getting devices that have um, encrypted passcodes but one thing we might want to do too is through consent, ask the, uh, the owner or the possessor of the electronic the device that's going to be searched is that when it's seized or when it's surrendered, we ask for passcodes. Of course, this can be done explicitly and the person might say no. Um, and I, I, absent, we're, we'll talk about compelling this later and the challenges with that. Uh, but one thing you might want to do is if a device is being seized by a search warrant for a later forensic search, 
you might want to let the individual know it's like, hey, are there any phone numbers or any sort of contact information you want to copy down before I see it? I have to watch you do this to make sure you don't alter anything or delete anything. And then maybe a good observant law enforcement investigator can keep track of that person as they unlock their device and keep memory of that code. But talk with your examiner, of course, for this and other issues as well. And uh, also never forget a manual examination of a device. And this includes when we're talking to witnesses who receive texts from a suspect or from a witness. Um, ask those witnesses when we're prepping our cases, oh, you, you mentioned a text message. Have you ever seen what kind of device a person uses? Do they ever use any other devices to send messages? But we wanna be asking, and I know in, in, in with a digital evidence or digital investigation, there can be such a tendency to sort of think in, in the cloud that we forget maybe uh, sort of tangible things we wanna follow through with our witnesses. But ask our witnesses about uh, the devices that um, adversarial witnesses or offenders might use, how it's identified. And so again, we have ways that can link up a device with the later forensic examination and the content that's pulled from it into an offender as well. So cell phones, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, here's a more expansive thing, uh, expansive uh, uh, list of things that we might wanna be searching for from cell phones or really from any computer list uh, that might be providing a variety of information that's, uh, that's beyond our investigation. I would note for browser history though, and this is uh, something I learned from trial and error, is that when we do are looking for authority to search someone's internet history, a lot of folks are still utilizing multiple browsers. Maybe someone has Chrome, maybe someone has Safari, uh, Microsoft Edge, or what have you. We want to be sure that we're searching the browser history of, of each of those browsers, especially if, if folks might be jumping between browsers. Because if we only search one browser, we might be uh, missing evidence of, of searches or, or relevant browser history from, from other browsers as well. So lock devices, um, I, I'm gonna sort of give a shout out from Minnesota here, generally speaking, uh, but a lot of your uh, digital evidence law is, is, is relative to other jurisdictions, pretty straightforward and smooth. And it's, it's certainly appreciated someone that uh, has to research it and get in on it from the ground floor. Um, but uh, we talked a little bit about compelling someone's passcode and getting someone's passcode. And there's really two kinds of uh, uh, avenues and where this comes up is what happens when someone has a passcode that's biometric, uh, such as facial or a thumbprint scan or something like that, being able to get into the device that way, uh, versus when someone has an actual passcode, um, I'm trying to get my device up for a visual demonstration. Is suppose someone might have a passcode that's a, that's alpha that, that's an alpha numeric passcode of some kind to unlock a device. Of course, the risk is like too many incorrect passcodes might permanently lock and or delete a device. Um, so this issue, at least with the biometric passcodes, came up in State versus Diamond. And uh, here it was dealing with the trial court uh, that had granted the state's motion to compel the defendant to provide a fingerprint to unlock a cell phone that was seized in a burglary investigation. The Minnesota Supreme Court held that producing the fingerprint to unlock the cell phone, it's a non-testimonial act and it's not protected by the Fifth Amendment. So in Minnesota, the validity of using biometrics for a fingerprint passcode, and I don't think the analysis would be any different for facial recognition, uh, can be permitted. You can petition the court to compel someone to provide that, uh, just like you might be able to compel someone to give a handwriting sample, uh, a, a voice sample, just to hear what their voice sounds like, not to compel them to give some sort of testimony of the mind. Uh, just like you might be able to compel someone to give a blood sample or a DNA sample of some kind. That's the same sort of thing that, that we can do that's not going to be a violation of the Fifth Amendment. What's not clear and what I would recommend uh, not uh, being very cautious and using 
is if you're trying to show someone's control of the device that you do not use their compelled biometric as evidence to also show that they controlled the device. Like I know this is the defendant's advice device because when we compelled that person to give their fingerprint, it in fact opened the device. Um, then it might be for, you might be creating a defense issue or a potential issue where, hey, look, uh, the compelled cell phone wasn't, the compelled biometric wasn't just used to unlock the device for a search. It was also used for my, for the defendant to give testimonial evidence as to their control of the device. And I think it's probably pretty rare in many cases where you're going to need that biometric to show the control of the device. Because once you have a device open, you're going to have a lot of evidence in the device that's going to be able to show who used this device, who utilized, who controlled it, um, what account it was uh, accessed to, um, the text messages, the photo, the photos, the contact information. All this is probably going to be sufficient to be able to show uh, the control of the device that you don't have to use a compelled biometric uh, to make that argument. Uh, the Diamond Court was, however, um, pretty uh, explicit in the, what they are not deciding is if providing a password is testimonial. And that was in footnote five. They said that's an issue they're not getting to right now. Um, that's going to be a, a fun argument. Um, as much as I can, I would recommend kicking that argument uh, down the road if you can. Uh, because I, 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 my own personal view is uh, trying to show uh, a, a password or a compelled password. In most jurisdictions, that's more likely to be found or more usually found to be testimonial and protected by the Fifth Amendment. Um, that's going to be harder to compel, um, but that's not final. And certainly the same arguments you can use about a compelled biometric can also be used for a, a compelled uh, alphanumeric uh, password. It's just, I, I think most courts are sort of drawing the line, biometric, uh, compelled biometric, okay. Uh, compelled alphanumeric, not okay, because that's forcing someone to, to, uh, to disclose it. All right, so let's get into to theories of admission. So we have our, our digital evidence um, what are some different theories about which we can get it into court? And again, Minnesota is one of those fortunate jurisdictions um, that has a, a really broad standard of admissibility uh, about how to get digital evidence in, and they, they have enough trust for the fact finder to just let the digital evidence in, and the fact finder figures out the weight or credibility to attach to it. And those are my favorite kinds of rules, especially having worked in a jurisdiction that uh, has a lot of hoops to jump through for admissibility. But anytime we're trying to get digital evidence in, it's a, a suggested sort of analytical evidence that, about how we approach the problem is that we first try to identify uh, what it is physically we're trying to admit, what it is that we're talking about is being admitted about digital evidence, what form is the digital evidence coming in? And this might be something that's overlapping or complementary. Digital evidence doesn't have to come in through one avenue. Then the second question is gonna be, we be able to articulate how we're going to authenticate it, how we're going to show it is what we are saying it is and by, authored by who we're saying is authored it. And closely linked and overlapping with that is the content of this digital evidence. How are we linking it to the adverse party or to whatever theory of the case we have? So let's take that first question. The different kinds of category, and again, this is by no mean exhaustive, but the types of digital evidence that we might be trying to get in is someone's testimony of digital evidence. Um, what they saw on, on a text message, what they saw on a Facebook post or a, a social media blog or comment or something like that, someone testifying to that. Records of from a company about what was posted or when something was, was uh, when a phone call occurred or was received or went to voicemail. Maybe it's a screenshot from someone's device, a screenshot of, of someone's uh, cell phone showing a particular text message or call log or message received. Uh, maybe a, a screenshot or photograph of someone's computer monitor. 
Maybe it's a screen recording, someone taking a video, which is pretty much a, a, a moving picture of the screenshot or photograph, but maybe it's a screen recording of observing someone as they go through and open up a file, what has to be accessed to it. Maybe it's a screen recording of a text thread or email thread uh, that can't fit on one document as we, as we stroll through, uh, et cetera. Maybe it's a forensic report from a, from a forensic digital examiner that's going to come complete with, the, with hyperlinks and et cetera to show what was in. Or maybe it's a manual examination device, either someone's testimony of the manual of the device or a video or photo of the device uh, that's being offered to admit. Or sometimes we might be using a combination of these things uh, to show one particular item of digital evidence, be it a text message or an email. But whatever it is that we're trying to, we wanna be able to identify it, like what is, uh, the form, uh, the, what, how are we trying to admit this di digital evidence, this email, this text message, uh, this account, what have you. <laughs> and in terms of authenticating, what's, what's so uh, frankly convenient about Minnesota is that uh, it really does sort of go to the fundamentals of, of the rules of evidence, Minnesota rules of evidence with authentication. And, uh, and not to make people flash back to law school, uh, but I, I sort of remember this portion of the rules of evidence was almost sort of skipped over. So much time was spent discussing hearsay and exceptions to hearsay uh, that it seemed the parts uh, in the rules of evidence after hearsay were sort of just brushed over. Um, and digital evidence is our chance to really dive deep into that. Uh, but of course, the fundamental rule for authentication is to remember, of course, is that it's, it, it's a prerequisite for admissibility. It's a condition precedent to admissibility. Um, and essentially how that can be satisfied is before we try to get it into a piece of uh, digital evidence or any kind of extrinsic evidence in, we have to have evidence sufficient to support a finding that it is what we claim it to be that if we're claiming it's a text message sent by the defendant, heck, if it's we're claiming it's a text message sent by the victim, uh, we have to have evidence to show what, it, what we're claiming it to be. Now, if it's digital evidence coming from a friendly witness, that's pretty easy to do because the person can just say, hey, I sent that, I took a photograph of that, I shot that. The challenge is, of course, is when it's, a, it's an adverse party uh, we have to have some evidence showing that, hey, look, they made that, they were a party to the transaction. And the rules of evidence also, subparagraph B, they talk about ways about how we can complete this authentication. And our next rule, 902, talks about things that are self-authenticating, but for things that are not self-authenticating, there's a variety of methods the two we're going to concern ourselves with here, which are not exhaustive, but something can be authenticated by testimony of someone with knowledge that an item is what it's claimed to be. And it can also be distinctive characteristics of the, and the like, such as MO or distinctive patterns. A lot of people can be sort of intimidated by digital evidence and the evidentiary challenges in getting digital evidence in. Uh, um, especially lawyers that are probably older than me, like my generation, it can seem newfangled and really challenging. But really, the, the conceptual challenges with digital evidence are the same kinds of challenges that might exist with getting in a telegraph or a typewritten letter, in that it's not facially apparent who the author is or who the person that sent it, but there's still ways that those things can be authenticated. Uh, for something like a telegram, you can get records, uh, you can look at financial records, you can look at uh, the carrier company's records to find out who it was sent. Maybe the content of the telegram can help us authenticate it. Same thing with a typewritten letter. We can put the pieces together uh, to support our, our claim that it is what it's claimed to be. Electronic evidence, digital evidence in the form of email, text messages, social media comments, et cetera, can be done the same way uh, or with the same sort of uh, perseverance. So different ways to authenticate and talking about it. It can be testimony from people that are involved with the communication um, and that it's consistent with the content of social media. Hey, yeah, I get messages from Bill 
uh, from Facebook or from Twitter or from Instagram, they use this screen name. I know it's really Bill because we've talked about stuff on his Instagram account. So I know he sent these messages. Um, hey, I know this is Bill because the Bill told me to show up here because later he did show up after he text messaged me this. Um, maybe there could be uh, an author could admit, hey, I am a police officer. I interviewed Bill after uh, before we took him into custody. I showed him these text messages. I asked him, is this are these your text messages? Uh, Bill said yes. Um, there could be admission of ownership or access of device where content was recovered from. We searched Bill's phone. Um, we found these text messages that the victim had received. Um, we also know that these text messages were sent from Bill's phone because we found a bunch of other mess uh, messages from Bill and photos of Bill's kids and Bill's house and Bill's uh, bills and things like that. Um, and not only that, but we sent certified records to Bill's cell phone company and they gave us certified records back as at, uh, at such and such a time Bill was sending and receiving text messages consistent with what we found. These can be a variety of ways to authenticate these messages. Something else that, that can come up, uh, but may not often come up is the best evidence rule, which is sort of a forgotten rule. The idea that uh, when we're getting in a piece of evidence, it has to be the original. But this really has a broad definition in modern practice in that in the sense that an original uh, under rules of evidence for electronically stored information like an email or, or text message, it doesn't have to be the hard drive. Um, it can be any printout or output readable by sight if it accurately reflects the information. Um, and that covers the definition of original for the best evidence. It can also be a duplicate, like a screenshot, if it accurately reproduces the original. So the best evidence rule isn't going to be as often. But whenever we have digital evidence, we want to be able to link it to our adverse party as well. Um, and we want to put them behind whatever the digital evidence we have is and, and what's involved. And here's a list of the different kinds of digital evidence. And the questions and, and I just want to sort of be getting people to think about it, but the questions we want to try to be able to use to make the link is talk about where the device was found that contained the digital evidence that's being utilized. If it came from an account such as a Facebook account or, or cell phone account, who is the account registered to? Um, do we have a witness that's familiar with the regular use of that account, maybe even outside the context of our particular case? Um, are there words or phrases that are commonly used by the offender? And those are the sorts of things. Maybe some of the same things we're using to authenticate is also going to make the link of the uh, piece of digital evidence to the offender. So let's get into some cu couple quick exercises. And I'm hoping the, well, I'll set out the example for you. And I'm hoping I can get some interaction either through someone's microphone or through the chat window. Uh, but let me give you the, uh, the example here. Uh, we have an offender that's charged with stalking after repeatedly tweeting threatening messages to the victim. Uh, state executed a search warrant for the offender and victim's Twitter accounts. Twitter emailed a PDF document containing the requested records. All right. So First question, and again, these are really sort of basic questions. We're prosecuting the stalking case. We're trying to show these threatening messages sent over Twitter, maybe through DMs, direct messaging. First question in analyzing it, what are we trying to admit? Anyone? You can turn Please. video on too. Is that Dave? Uh, yes, the saying the tweets. The tweets. Okay, how are we trying to get the tweets in? When we're we're getting them admitted into court, how are we going to publish them? How are we going to present them? How how are they getting into the record? Um, I would think through a printout. All right. So the PDF. That's exactly it. Um, how are we going to to authenticate it? What would be your strategies to authenticate it? Can you go back? Go back a screen. Sure. So we've got the, the um, so uh, authenticated through Twitter, um, through the, the actual, um, through the records, 
um, uh, through Twitter providing uh, the records themselves, um, uh, I think would be at least part of it. And how are you going to link it to the offender? Because uh, Twitter will be able to show that the will be able to see that the account um, uh, was used uh, to make other posts, uh, uh, post other tweets that that. Um, well, I guess we'll have to make sure that the that some of the tweets um, are linked to other actions of the defend of the offender statements that were made um, in some other ways, so some showing in some way that this account has been used by the offender for other purposes. So that's good. And uh, what if the offender says, or the offender's attorney says, "How do you know someone didn't take over my account to threaten the victim?" What other evidence are you looking for to say, "Oh, yeah, how do I not know that?" Well, there is a pa there is a password um, uh, to the account, uh, and so. Um, but yeah, I'll admit I've I've struggled with this myself. How, how in fact to, to prove that? There might, and these, these are good questions. And I mean, there's a couple of ways you might be able to argue. You can might want to argue like, well, look, that's that's speculation. There's no evidence that he gave the password of the account to, to anyone else. Um, so we can't just sort of fill in the blank with a speculation that someone could have done it. Uh, but look at these other tweets he sent that we talked to people about who recognize him talking about this Twitter account. He's never complained about anyone having access to his account before this event came up. Um, and if he's threatening the victim's accounts, now you don't always have these facts. I, I'm not trying to sound naive, uh, but maybe he's made other threats to the victim too. And it's like, well, no one else was really threatening the victim during this time or motive to threaten the victim. Um, so he was maybe telephone threats or gave other threats to the victim or, um, or heck, maybe he even made verbal threats to the victim too. And in combination with that, it's like, well, uh, yes, it's it's not <laughs> mathematical certainty. I can tell you someone didn't access his account, but given the context of everything, it's unlikely. Right. Um, but uh, just uh, the business records was a, was a great thing about uh, sort of the, that initial authentication hurdle. There's a hearsay exception for records of regularly conducted activity. Um, so these tweets, we can bring them in as admissible hearsay by showing Twitter keeps these records. And Twitter is usually going to send these records with an affidavit. Hey, these are kept in the regular course of business activity by a, uh, a custodian of the records. And of course, Minnesota statute says business records can come in as evidence, which is probably always uh, handy to keep on hand with, with the court, or maybe even offer these in sort of a pretrial motion admissibility. So we're not caught up in the middle of a court trying to litigate that. So I'm happy to accept other comments, but uh, let me get on to the, the second of the three oh, examples sorry. here. Could I yes. comment? Sure, please. Thank you. Um, as a practical matter, unless it's a domestic homicide or something else extremely serious, I don't think our office would want to spend the money to bring in a custodian of records for the Twitter records. I think instead we would probably try to put them in like we do other things where the as long as we have a victim who's able to testify that assuming it's a woman so i'm gonna say she um would be able to testify that she received these that she knows that he is a twitter user that they've communicated with one another on twitter before i would use her to authenticate it absent my office being willing to pay for a custodian of record to come in well, I'm trying to, I think you, the, the records, and I'm trying to remember, but maybe you don't, I think they're self-authenticating under no, the, oh, not. Minnesota doesn't have that exception. So you actually have to bring a custodian in because you don't have the self-authenticating 902, five or six exception that most people do. Right. And our state court does not uh, permit that. So they don't permit, so that's a good, a good point. And thank you for pointing that out. I had been thinking... I'd given this presentation to a different jurisdiction on Friday that had self-authenticating records, and that was in my head. So yes, absent being able to bring a custodian of records in, um, then yeah, I, I agree with you. If you do have the ability to bring a custodian of records in or someone who's familiar with, uh, with the account, then, then that's great. That can be used as a compliment, uh, especially because they'd be a disinterested party. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, absent that self-authenticating uh, authentication exception in 902, that, uh, that, that creates other hurdles. Uh, you might be able to even get a stipulation though from the other party, um, especially, but maybe not too. So our second example is you have a defendant that's charged with misdemeanor domestic violence uh, battery after slapping the victim. Uh, the battery occurred during the fight over money because rent was due. A victim took screenshots of the text conversation on her cell phone. Uh, before the fight, the victim and offender exchanged the following text messages. The victim sent, are you coming straight home? Don't forget rent is due. Uh, the defendant's text message was, don't piss me, response was, don't, piss, or I should say the response from the phone number associated with the defendant, or the text message from the number associated with the defendant was, don't piss me off, I had a shitty week. So uh, in this circumstance, in terms of digital evidence, what is it we're trying to, uh, to admit? And I know these are, they might seem like straightforward questions that you think there's a trick. Um, but uh, it's actually just sort of trying to think of the exercise to think about sort of fundamentals. So what is it we're trying to admit? How about just because we had, could I invite uh, Yami or Margaret to participate on this one? Uh, okay, I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, so your question is, why would this come in? Uh, no, what are we trying to admit in terms of digital evidence? Uh, oh. Well, that the rent is due because the fight was over money. So that exchange would help support uh, what the victim is saying. Right, or that's why we're trying to get these. Uh, but how are we going to try to get these text messages in? Through the victim. Through the victim. And how, how are we going to show them through the victim? Well, presumably uh, the victim provided screenshots if the police have this information. Okay. So either the victim provided the screenshots or an officer on scene took a picture of the victim's phone. So either way, that still photo would, I would put it in through the victim. Okay, so the victim will bring it in, but it's the screenshots of the text message authenticated through the victim and, and how are we going to link the text messages or at least from the number associated with the defendant how are we going to try to how would you link well, that to if it's the a defender? domestic case that means their family or household members which would indicate that the victim knows what phone number the defendant uses if their family or household members so they would be able to uh, provide that background information of why they know it's that person absolutely and so in the here, uh, it's an unpublished opinion, which I, I know can't be cited as, as precedent, but it's uh, the closest analogy I could find from the Minnesota Court of Appeals in 2008. Uh, but it's essentially the same fact pattern, and this is a common fact pattern we use for different jurisdictions. Uh, the state admitted into evidence three photographs of the screen of the victim's cell phone that displayed information about the defendant and text messages he sent her. A uh, police officer testified that defendant called him from same number as listed to defendant and victim's phone and really citing nothing more than the rules of, of evidence we cited earlier, the court found sufficient foundation for, for authentication. And there's really, there's really nothing contradicting I, I found in Minnesota law to this, uh, to what, what I would think seems like a pretty straightforward. Now, some other jurisdictions might have, have you go through a few more hoops Minnesota does, does not appear to be one of those jurisdictions, thankfully. So the admissibility and same thing what Margaret was talking about, same as a photograph, it's a true and accurate representation of the screen. Um, yes, there, there might be arguments about uh, the, uh, the weight of it, like, oh, how do we know that the victim didn't make this up or concoct it? Those are all weight arguments that we, we let our fact finders figure out. So our next, and looking at the time, I'm gonna sort of go through it uh, a little bit more quickly here. We have a defendant charged with non-consensual distribution of an intimate image after posting three photographs to the victim's Facebook account. 
Uh, the photographs were nudes of the victim that she had taken with her cell phone and sent to the defendant while they were dating. Uh, the victim deleted the photos from her Facebook account immediately upon seeing them. Search warrant was issued for the defendant's Facebook, but the account was deleted. Uh, victim had the original photographs in her cell phone. So again, the analysis we go through here, um, remember that first example or illustration of how things can be authenticated uh, through testimony alone. And this is called the pictorial witness theory. And this is not every jurisdiction follows this, Minnesota does. Uh, State versus Winbush from the Minnesota Supreme Court in 2018. One example of authentication is testimony of a witness with knowledge that a matter is what it claimed to be. Uh, that's the B1 illustration under uh, 901. This conventional method, method for authenticating is referred to as the pictorial witness theory because the copy is thought to be a pictorial representation of what the witness observed. And um, here what happened is the investigator <laughs> authenticated a printout of defendant's Facebook page, uh, which he had observed on the screen. And that, that was sufficient. Um, so I think that same analysis or pictorial witness theory would probably apply to, to something like the hypothetical we had and is really a generous rule of admissibility. So final area I just wanna hit in a couple of minutes and I know we started a little bit late, but I'm gonna try to get us done at the targeted time, especially when folks have to go to court is protecting digital privacy. And this of course is a recognition that when we're dealing with digital evidence, um, that these contain massive amounts of information and massive amounts of our, of our witnesses and victims' life. And as much as we can, while, while maintaining the integrity of our, of, of our investigations, we wanna be able to protect and respect the privacy of our victims. Um, the privacy interests in digital evidence was recognized or appreciated, is probably a better way to put it, uh, by the US Supreme Court in Riley versus California. Um, in that case, a, a, a police officer had been using a work-related phone uh, and it had uh, basically inappropriate work things on it. He was fired. He said his privacy interests were violated on, on it. And uh, the court agreed that they, there was a lot of private information, but because it was a work phone, the privacy argument didn't succeed. Um, a lot of times you might have with evidence that we that the government doesn't have in our possession, the expectation from defense counsel uh, wanting to access our victims and witnesses, digital records. Um, but if it's not in our, our, our possession, there's good language or good theory about why it's not Brady in the sense that if we don't have it, we're not in the position where the, as a government, we're, we're meant to, to, to have to act as valets essentially for opposing counsel. This principle is well recognized, and here's a great Supreme Court case from your jurisdiction that actually we reference in other jurisdictions. Uh, here, a trial court was reversed for ordering a victim to turn over cell phone to the defense forensic act expert. Uh, she was a sexual assault victim. Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that the victim didn't waive the right to privacy in her phone. Uh, by bringing a sexual assault disclosure and allowing uh, the, uh, the police to copy a limited portion of her phone. And B, uh, the BH court uh, recognized Riley in uh, privacy concerns with electronic devices that when there's motions to compel victims or witnesses to uh, disclose such data, the court should carefully exam examine those. So, What's important to remember is too, for motions to compel, if the victim has a phone, there's a good uh, scope to argue that, hey, look, that's the, the victims and uh, their privacy interests trump. If we hold that phone, and sometimes that's gonna be necessary, then I, I think generally it's the Kyle V. Whitley rule that if we know it, it's the defense is gonna be entitled to know it. If there's things that we think are beyond the scope of the case, uh, we should probably ask the court for in-camera inspection or protective order to, to not dis disclose or allow, give, give the defense privy things uh, to things that are outside the scope of the case. So here are some other resources just about privacy issues, which we'd recommend. Um, the, so this is gonna be the wrap up here. I'm right at the uh, full 60 minutes, although a little bit after two o'clock because we started late. Um, so here's my identification, my name, please reach out any issues that you have, compliments, complaints, anything of those nature.
So, and I do want to recommend office hours for any sort of uh, issues you want to talk about with the other prosecutors nationwide. We'd love to have you there every third Thursday. So folks, I'm going to stay on the line just in case there's any other questions. I'm going to try to be the last person to leave, but thank you again so much for your attention. Look forward to seeing you all for uh, the uh, part four, uh, which I'm sure you have the schedules more available, I think is October 14th. Thanks everyone.